Well, thank you very much for those uh, kind words. Good morning to all of you. It's a matter of uh, great pleasure for me, as well as privilege, to be asked to give this lecture when we are uh, celebrating the occasion of Srinivasan's 80th birthday. Well, there was a there was a meeting in the United States as well, and. Although I would have loved to go there, I'm sorry I couldn't have done that. So I'm very happy to have this occasion when I can personally and publicly um, say what uh, uh, the pleasure it has been to have known him from his student days and have continued to interact with him all along and the work that uh, he has done. Well, I did. Um, write a little piece about him and uh, after much thinking I chose the title From Classical to Quantum Down to Earth to the Cosmic because what is remarkable about Srinivasan's work is that he has made very original contributions in about as wide a range of scales as you can think of um, from right down terrestrial or even smaller uh, statistical mechanics, low density dynamics, all the way to the cosmological scales. So the title of the seminar, of this uh, workshop, Turbulence from Angstroms to Light Years, captures that spirit much better than my title did. <laughs> so I think it is striking and uh, describes very well the range of uh, Srinivasan's interest. I don't know of anybody else in the world who has covered that whole range the way that uh, Srinivasan has done. So, I wish you many more years of achievement, Srinivasan, and of joy in your work, and happiness in your work as well as in your personal life. Well, I um, um, uh, an indication of um, um, of this wide range of interests that Srinivasan had is that in this audience, there are quite a few engineers like me, but there are also many physicists. And when I was uh, thinking about what I should speak about here. Um, you know, the chairman mentioned the monsoons. I've been spending a lot of time on clouds trying to understand them, although it's nothing directly to do with engineering. And I thought I would speak about that. But then I've spoken about it, and some people here will have heard about it. It struck me maybe I should speak for once about a real engineering problem, but a real engineering problem which is also a great uh, challenge. So, um, I have chosen, therefore, something must something which uh, has also a somewhat crazy title, and I must explain the title first before I go on to talk about it. Uh, a gas turbine is um, you know about the most sophisticated piece of mechanical engineering that man has made operates at high temperatures has to be light advanced uh, materials and a crazy fluid dynamics and that's really the point that I want to make um, I'll, I'll show you I'll show you uh, the kind of flows that you can observe on a gas turbine blade or you can compute. Uh, there's so many things that is happening that uh, a good way to look at it is that it is a zoo. It's a flow zoo. Many different kinds of flow, fluid dynamical phenomena that you can think of seem all to be occurring on those little blades in those gas turbines. 
I'll come back to that and tell you a little bit more about it. But on that blade, if it's a zoo, there's a lot of wildlife in that zoo. And what do I mean by wild? Um, so let me start with mild. Well, that is um, on the yardnet there. It's a standard number. It's a heat transfer. It's a, it's a non-dimensional heat transfer coefficient. That's an important variable on gas turbine blades because they operate at very high temperatures. And um, here is a transition occurring on a five-degree cone. Okay, Mach eight. Mach eight seems like a high speed. And uh, you can see that the flow is going from lamina, the lower curve there, uh, to turbulent, which is the higher curve there. And you can see that there's a relatively smooth curve taking the heat transfer rates all the way from the low values to the high values, uh, going from lamina um, at uh, lower Reynolds numbers, and uh, the Reynolds numbers are on the axis, 10 to the 6, 3 into 10 to the 6, and then smoothly going on to the turbulent. Well, I started my my fluid dynamics career looking at transitions of this kind. And it follows a law, a rule, or a model, which surprisingly is very similar to what happens at very low speeds. I did it at 30 meters per second, so I'm happy to see that it looks similar at Mach 8. But you can see that the changes here are relatively slow, from a Reynolds number of 3 million to 9 million. Now, I'm later on going to show what probably happens on a gas turbine blade. I say probably because I'm not absolutely sure. This, this has not yet been observed. Is this. Now, this uh, plot, the skin friction coefficient, that's to say the surface has a, has a stress acting on it, viscous stress, and that contributes to the drag. So that friction, non-dimensionalized by the dynamic pressure in the incoming flow, is the skin friction coefficient. That's what's there on the y-axis. On the x-axis, you're going along the blade, a card of one, and you can see what happens to that skin friction coefficient. In particular, I want to see, I want you to see what happens to that pink curve at the bottom. There are two pink curves, a dashed curve and a full curve. Take a look at that full curve. Well, you can count how many times it is jumping up and down. There is one peak very close to the leading edge, another a very sharp one, and a third one, slightly milder one, fourth one, slightly broader one. And then, depending on which of those two solutions you pick, it drops. And indeed, in one of them, the dotted one, it drops deeply. In fact, it goes negative. This friction coefficient goes negative. Comes back up again steeply. And settles down, and you go up there. Those two curves at the bottom are... Um, Direct numerical simulations, that's to say you start with the full equations. No other, no other approximations. Full Navier-Stokes equations are uh, solved uh, without making any models for anything. The one thing that's different between the two is the resolution. For the dotted curve, dashed curve, the resolution is somewhat higher than for the other one. I put down there the number of grid points you have in the domain. 94 million, 129 million. They're not actually very highly, highly different, actually. Nevertheless, you can see that while the solutions agree over much of the flow, they really disagree, well, at least behave somewhat differently, uh, between about 60% and 80% of the car. So the first thing is that the solutions I depend very much on, on the resolution, and I'll keep coming back to that. There are other curves here on this diagram, and I'll talk about them a little later on. But before I go ahead, perhaps I should say a few words 
about um, turbulence research. Um, <clears throat> turbulence is a problem of interest, <coughs> not just to engineers. Of course, for engineers, it's, a, it's an important part of the way they go about analyzing any flow. <coughs> but I think, I think I can recognize at least three kinds of philosophies in approaching turbulence. One is what you may call deep science. Well, the equations governing fluid flow, the viscous fluid, are nonlinear. And it is to this day has not been possible to make any strong predictions or to be able to understand exactly how turbulence works. And in this deep science effort, the focus is usually on the simplest possible problem. The simplest possible problem is, uh, appears to be homogeneous isotropic turbulence. That's to say, turbulence which doesn't vary in space and has no preferred direction. And therefore, it may, if unless forced, decay. So that's, that's a kind of simplest turbulence you can think of. So that's, that's really deep science. And a lot of mathematicians and physicists have looked at it in great detail, and some engineers too, in their own way. Well, there is at the other end of the spectrum, the technological need. The engineer who is actually making things. And uh, he uses methods which are based on Reynolds average equations. And uh, larger simulations, maybe occasionally these days, a lot of test data. But as another engineer said, he said, we don't wait to understand the digestive process before eating. Therefore, they're not always looking after the, the highest degree of understanding exactly why the flow behaves that way, but um, are willing to make approximations, uh, take empirical data, put them into the models and so on. So RANS, uh, for example, depends a great deal on uh, measured data, which they are extracting um, parameters which appear in those equations. RANS equations are probably, um, from one point of view, the most sophisticated inter interpolation formulas that you can think of, because they, they are partial differential equations. So really, people are cooking up partial differential equations, so to speak, which are more or less like what fluid flows does. Then, I think there are a group of people, I'm a whom I would like to put myself, and uh, many others, a large number, who are actually interested in the dynamics of turbulent shear flows and would under like to understand them uh, from, by means of uh, theories, hypotheses, computer simulations, and um, obs observations, experiments. And what you find in turbulent shear flows is an amazing diversity. Homogeneous isotropic turbulence is one sort of thing. But in turbulent shear flows, the, the variety of behavior you get is huge. It's rich in ideas, applications, and controversies. And the universe is full of crazy, beautiful, fearsome flows. I mean, it's, uh, it is, the diversity is extraordinary. Now, <clears throat> I was, when I was thinking about it, um, I came across, well, I remembered that uh, uh, Feynman would come to my rescue. Uh, sorry, yeah. And he was also one who noticed how much, how much fluid flows can vary. And he says, well, just the fact that we have written an equation doesn't remove from the flow of fluids a charm, a mystery, or surprise. If such variety is possible in a simple equation with only one parameter, how much more is possible with complex equations? And I must tell you that um, during the years when Feynman was interested in fluid dynamics, I was fortunate to be at uh, Caltech as a student, and we would drop in 
uh, once in a few months or uh, six months or so, we would drop in to see what we were all doing. And uh, he, would, he, would, he would talk to those experiments that were going on and uh, would go away saying, amazing, amazing, and so on. He, he was absolutely uh, amazed that the kind of uh, experiments that some of them sim seemed simple, some were not so simple, but we didn't understand. We couldn't predict many of those things. And he actually tried himself. He came to the conclusion that uh, the flow problem in a pipe is probably the simplest. And uh, the story is that he gave up after about a year. Turbulence, of course, is actually a really serious problem. And von Neumann, who said computing might help you, but he also said, the impact of an adequate theory of turbulence on certain very important parts of pure mathematics may be even greater. You know the equations. You don't know the solutions. So it is a mathematical problem in a, in a certain sense. And the variety of those uh, flows, I list them here, and we'll come back to them later on. And we are at the bottom of the slide. Flow separation in wall bounded flows, and the flow will move away from the surface. I'll show you pictures. Transition from laminar to turbulent flow, studied for a long time, more than 100 years. Reverse transition from turbulent to laminar flow, or quasi laminar flow. And that's more like some 60, 70 years. Coherent structures, that's to say turbulent flows are not all fully disordered. Ordered structures are present in turbulent shear flows. And there is more like 50 years now. And effects of curvature, rotation, stratification, heating, and so on, all leading to very interesting and diverse flows. Let me very quickly take you through a gallery of fluid flows. They're all shear flows. They're all turbulent shear flows in some sense, with some other things added there, just to tell you what they're like. Here are clouds, which is the other area where I've been spending a lot of time in a couple of decades. Cumulus flows. The cumulus clouds have been called the queen of the tropics. They're, they're there in the sky for us to enjoy what their shapes are. Cascading water there. These are uh, joke falls, known to all people in Karnataka very well. Beautiful, awesome. Tidal bows along rivers. Tornadoes. Here is a mixture of water and chaos over, over, over the East China Sea. You can see those word seas there, like common word seas behind that island. At the upper, uh, actually, Maybe I should stand here. You can see that island there, shedding wood seas, and different kinds of clouds here, disorder and ordered wood seas. This is a homogeneous isotropic turbulence, a numerical simulation. You can see high wave number, let's say small scale uh, structure in the turbulence, random, but also something like tubes or so, or wood seas there. Here is turbulence behind a grid in a wind tunnel, much experimented to understand homogeneous turbulence. And you can see the grid will be there. <clears throat> this is a flow visualization. And these are the wakes of those uh, bars there. And how the scales increase as they go downstream and become a random stochastic field. The boundary layer. Um, Everybody will be familiar with the boundary layer idea. Uh, it is that the Reynolds number becomes very large. The flow sort of divides into two parts, two layers. Where the Reynolds number is large, the outer flow is basically inviscid. But if you have a surface, there must be a no-slip boundary condition on it. And that no-slip boundary condition is met where the viscosity is always important even at very high Reynolds number. So there's a thin boundary layer where viscosity is important. And the rest of the flow, outer flow, is um, virtually invisible. Um, that idea is about now 120 years old. It goes back to Prantl. 
And you can say that on this page was where modern fluid dynamics, in my view, was born. Because at that time, there were controversies between, um, well, let's say, people who did hydrodynamics and people who did hydraulics. Hydraulics was empirical, hydrodynamics was mathematical. It used to be said, hydrodynamics explains things which you don't observe, and the hydraulics people uh, give results which they can't explain. So, um, this was sort of bridge. It took some time to, discuss, to realize that it bridged by this idea. And uh, these are the equations for the boundary layers, written down here. And he even made an estimate for the drag. And even draw, drew figures of what happens, how a flow can separate. Said if you have an adverse pressure gradient, it will say pressure gradient, pressure is increasing this way, the flow will actually go back. Turns here, the flow is going from left to right on this plate. But at some point, the flow will separate, and near the wall, it will come from right to left. And you can see that makes difficult boundary conditions and so on. Here is another case of separation near the leading edge of an aerofoil. Behind a sphere. Here is the pressure at the rear stagnation point. Uh, on the sphere at uh, Reynolds numbers of, uh, um, well, here is it uh, 10, 10 to the 7. It is crazy. It's absolutely crazy how, how the stagnation, uh, how the back pressure at that point varies. And this is from many different labs in the world. And it's amazing that although there is some scatter, how, um, how um, um, accurately or how, how precisely they cluster around these things. And, and, and every one of these things where, where a letter is stuck, is some small change, sometimes a big change in the character of the flow. Transition. This is Reynolds making his experiment from laminar to turbulent flow. Here is transition on a flat plate. What you saw was transition on a tube, which is what Reynolds saw before, before it becomes fully turbulent, flashes. In the 1950s, Emmons in the United States uh, proposed, sorry, proposed that um, uh, transition occurred this way with spots, islands of turbulence moving on that plate, growing then merging, so became fully turbulent. That's the picture that I think uh, it takes. Uh, we now know that most parts are born in a relatively small area and then grow from there, whereas you have laminar flow in the leading edge. Here is a transition on a wing. You can see uh, that on this wing, because of an adverse uh, pressure gradient there, you have a zigzag, but um, it's not a steady front, uh, frontier. Well, that's what happens in a smoke. Okay. You can also go back from turbulent to laminar. You, this, is a, this is a little coil around this drum. Flow is coming in turbulent, uh, coming in and becomes turbulent. As you can see, this thin red dye fills up the place. But if you inject this green dye here, it doesn't fill it up. This flow which came in turbulent here has got laminar by the time it got here. So flow can go back from turbulent to laminar also. I must say that Srinivasan and I spent many years trying to understand this. Uh, here's another case where um, <clears throat> you can have transition, but look at the one on the right hand side. This is a simple jet here, it's laminar up to here becomes transitional there, it's turbulent jet. But if you put a little heat on top, so that there's a density stratification here, lower density upstairs, this transition, this turbulent flow is killed. So it can go back to turbulent. High speeds, I'll show you this picture here. If you take an ordinary boundary layer, turbulent boundary layer, well, and visualize the flow, this is the structure that you'll see. 
Okay, that's really what the turbulent flow is like. If you put it under a favorable pressure gradient, well, it becomes tame, it becomes mild. Since now, uh, elongate, and all of that chaos that you see here is uh, much weaker. And um, that's what happens if you put in a highly favorable pressure gradient. Um, the velocity gradient outside the boundary layer is this way, increasing. And at first, this is the skin friction coefficient again. At first, the flow behaves as if it is fully turbulent. But then actually, the skin friction coefficient drops. And to find out why it drops uh, is, of course, a, uh, uh, something which I think we now basically understand. So the boundary layer thins down. The skin friction coefficient drops, and it goes back once again to turbulent flow. And here is order, and this order flows. Um, famous picture due to Brown and Roshko on the mixing layer. Two different velocities in the stream, one here, another here. And although this is fully turbulent flow, you can see ordered vortex structures. Here is a cross-section of a plume, or a jet you can think of, uh, visualized by dye. This is a scalar intensity there, dye intensity. But if you do wavelet transforms, you'll find that at one scale, this picture hides this picture. And that's very organized motion. It's a vortex ring. This vortex ring, however, is uh, covered by that uh, random motion as well. And more such vortices. So here's a cartoon by Anatole Roshko, who passed away last year. What is turbulence? It said. Vortex tubes, vortex sheets, fractals, large structures, Kolmogorov got it right, maybe not quite right, so the argument still go on. Well, I now want to get back to the major thing here. Let me see. Oh, one second. This is really work in progress. It's been going on for about three or four years now. And I want to tell you roughly where we are. Um, <clears throat> now, the gas turbine, as I said, is one of the most sophisticated pieces of engineering. And here is one. Uh, the air comes in here. There are uh, compressors, low pressure compressors, and a shaft, and a high pressure compressor, and then turbines full of blades, all rotating. This is a low pressure turbine. And, um, well, temperatures of the order of 1,500 degrees centigrade. This one has a thrust of a range of 165 to 190 uh, kilonewtons. The question really is, what is happening on those blades, really? And um, surprising as it may seem, well, certain kinds of measurements are made, and RANS models are, are consistently used. We still, it's still only just now that we're beginning to understand that the variety of flows that you get on a gas turbine blade is not quite like the variety in nature, those slides. But many of those phenomena, all of them, seem to happen on the same blade, in the same condition. That is why the flow looks wild. Here are the wild animals in that zoo. And uh, that's one of those blades. These are some measurements made the 1990s, from uh, thin film gauges stuck on the surface. And you can see what's happening. You can see highly turbulent flow here, but suddenly it dies out. Flow has become laminar here, so it's gone through a reverse transition from turbulent to laminar flow. But then once again, it goes back turbulent. There's a little separation bubble here, and a little trip to make it turbulent. And in other cases, there are no trips. The separation bubble itself will act as a trip. Here is uh, a sort of sketch of the sort of things that can happen. Uh, the inflow comes in at an angle of attack, has to turn the sharp corner, high convex curvature. There may be a little area of separation there. And at the end of that separation, it goes to turbulent flow. Pressure gradient may relaminarize. There's an adverse pressure gradient that says the pressure increases here, may separate here again, may retransition. So all these things seem to go on. 
And to go through all of them and to compute what it is, is not easy. Now, I think I probably prefer to stand here if I don't have to point things, point to things. Uh, the blades operate in a highly turbulent environment. There are wakes from upstream rotor blades. The very high, strong so high surface curvature, the strong pressure gradient. But the important thing here is the Reynolds number range. It varies from about 20,000 at very high altitudes where the density is low to about a million. It's a relatively modest range as things go, but it's one of the most awkward Reynolds number ranges that you can think of because that's where the flows may go back from laminar to turbulent, may go from laminar to turbulent or back from there. And uh, there's very high pressure gradients. They can switch their nature as I showed you. Transition, relaminarization, separation are all still beyond uh, the models that engineers use. Surface heat transfer rates can vary a great deal. And there are very good economic, technological reasons why we should understand this in greater detail. At the lower end of the Reynolds number range, DNS is not possible, directly solution of the Navier-Stokes equations. So there have been several experimental studies made, and uh, they all have different results there on the remarks column. And uh, you can see um, many of them, the T106 is a series of German tests which have been widely used. You'll also see at the bottom, tests made here at the National Aerospace Labs. And I come back to those two as well. So basically, I'm considering two flows uh, in pink here. The one, um, from which we get data from Stadtmuller, and the other one done here in uh, Bangalore. Um, well, we are going to study direct numerical solutions of the Navier Stokes equations. They actually started around 2000. And in fact, uh, uh, a fair number were made around that time, but they stopped around 2006. For some reason, it's not very clear. I think it was realized that um, they were giving results which were not quite, uh, quite uh, agree with uh, the measurements. And so at that time, many people said, well, there's either something wrong with the experiment, or we are using incompressible navier stokes equations, whereas actually compressibility effects are important. Now, I had talked about this before these uh, DNS studies were made. So some three or four years ago, the gas turbine research establishment came here and said, would you, be, would you like to make some dear direct numerical simulations for us? And that's really what I want to describe. There are two of them there, one on the Indian data and one on the German data. And I want to show you what kind of results we get. Well, that's the German thing. See, if you take this, uh, if you take a rotor, you find it, the blades go around. So it's, it's a periodic arrangement around the circumference. So the computational domain is what's been shown there on the, on the left-hand side there. Um, the blade, the, we, we solve for the flow on the blade that's shown in the middle. But the upper end of the domain is the concave side, the lower boundary of the next blade. And the lower one is the upper boundary of the next blade on the other side. The flow curve comes in there, and I'm going to show you results from um, four different grid sizes. Let's just say four different resolutions. You break up the computational domain into little grids like this, and um, that's the leading edge, that's near the leading edge, and this is near the trailing edge. And I want to go into details about how you make those grids. That is also a bit of an art. And uh, this blade, the T106, is the most extensively studied low-pressure turbine blade uh, till date. 
is actually used in one of the Pratt Whitney engines. Here are the equations. <clears throat> we decided to do it for compressible flows right from the beginning because of these earlier doubts that people had expressed. And so here are the compressible Navier-Stokes equations. Top one there, conservation of mass. I won't go into those details. I presume that uh, you know these equations. There are the momentum equations. Um, acceleration terms on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, a pressure gradient, dp dxi, and the divergence of a stress gradient tensor that will include the viscous stresses. Uh, Uh, the viscous coefficient times the strain rate tensor, an energy equation uh, for an internal energy there and uh, um, with the kinetic energy added, and similarly capital H, the stagnation enthalpy, CPT plus half u squared. And on the right hand side, you have a kind of a um, viscous term, ui tau ij and a heat flux term. It depends on the conductivity. So the terms E and uh, the energy and the enthalpy are expanded here. And uh, they include, the energy includes the kinetic energy, and the enthalpy is uh, that energy plus P over rho. And we assume the usual equation of state for a perfect gas. This is an expression for the viscous stresses. Um, it depends on the strain rate, dui dxj plus duj dxi, and gives you um, normal stresses as well. And we assume a yeah, well-known law for the viscosity and thermal conductivity. So Rajesh Ranjan, the student who started off all of this with me, and Deshpande, uh, wrote a code which is called Anurup. Anurup is sort of Sanskrit for for simulation. You know, it tries to get the same 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 picture, same images. Uh, it's a finite volume discretizing code. I won't go into go into the, those details, but I want to show you the results. Now, this is actually just a simple pressure distribution. Now, the pressure distribution is the basic variable that you need, either as a designer or as a scientist. What, what's happening on the flow? And what is the pressure? How is the pressure distributed there? Now, you see the upper curve is actually the lower surface, so to speak. It's the convex surface. It's the pressure side. The lower curves are the upper surface of the blade, suction side. Now you can see that all these results, including the one due to missing, um, who I've taken results from one of his simulations, they agree on the pressure side. Surprisingly good agreement. And they say, okay, the experiments and the, and the computation agree. But you come to the other side, they don't agree. And in particular, the lower resolutions, grid A, grid B, See, Wissing's grid had uh, 17 million points. A had 25, B had 47, and C had 161. Now you see that um, if you look at grids A and B, which are down below here, in fact, they don't agree with the pressure distribution at all, measured pressure distribution. Like they're different in character, these two curves. Well, they go up, they come down, there's a little thing that goes up, this does something similar. But you now jump to this much higher resolution, 161. Well, it's very close, a red curve. Resolution is important to get even the pressure distribution right. And uh, that was one great lesson we learned from this. And uh, nobody had done, this. these are the highest resolutions at which these blades have been solved. The ones I'm uh, showing you that we did here in um, 
in JNC. Uh, the people who did things like uh, 17 and 25 said, as I told you, either, either the experiments are wrong or it's a subsonic thing. This is what a compressible thing gives you. And separation bubbles, there are separation bubbles. Once again, you can see how these vary. Uh, the smaller the, the cruise, the coarse grid, there's a separation bubble near the leading edge. Okay? You see flow that comes in here. This is the stagnation point. It's a high angle of attack. The order of 30, 40 degrees. It has to turn around this very sharp corner and it separates. Or so grid A says. Well, grid B seems to confirm that. But by grid C, that separation bubble has gone or at least it's become extremely small. On the other hand, the separation bubble has appeared on the uh, trailing edge. This is the trailing edge. This is the instantaneous picture. This is the mean picture. You can see what a profound influence uh, resolution has on the nature of the solutions. Let's look at the skin friction coefficient. Well, once again, the highest simulation, the, the highest resolution is this red curve. Well, you can see now the skin friction coefficient drops here. And uh, uh, increases. Transition. It seems more or less constant. Uh, then uh, drops, the flow separates, and uh, the separation bubble of the kind you saw earlier. But the other ones have skin friction jumping up and down, and the separation bubble here. But in fact, it is this uh, red curve that is, uh, uh, we don't have measured skin friction coefficients, but that is consistent with the pressure gradient that uh, the blade has. The boundary layers. Well, the boundary layers are not the classical boundary layers that Prantl described. As you can see, they're strongly affected by the curvature. Those velocities don't go off to constant values, as in that uh, blue dashed curve at uh, um, at the extreme right. Here once again. If you did the usual boundary layer theory, you would get that as a profile. And um, you do a higher order theory, you would get that. And if you actually compute, name your strokes, this is what you would get. At this curvature, name your strokes and the higher order theory agree. But at this curvature, at the maximum curvature that it has, they don't agree. And in fact, the boundary, even the boundary layer things can't, you can't get right unless you do DNS. Well, um, let me skip this. Now, suppose you took those coarse resolution things. This is what the flow will look like on the blade. Separation bubble at the leading edge, transition, relaminarization, uh, all the way here, and an adverse pressure gradient separates once again and goes back to transition. Unfortunately, that's not what happens on the blade. It's a, it's a relatively smooth thing. But you can get some idea of the way that the skin friction fluctuates. Um, that's the card, that's the skin friction coefficient. That would be the mean, but this is a fake solution, please remember. This is the way that the thing fluctuates as you go around the blade. Now let's take a look at um, the test made here. Uh, the STFE stands for a small turbofan engine. Okay, this was an experimental engine, which that made. And uh, NA had made some pressure distribution measurements there. And let me show you some of the data. 
Um, we did this on GPUs as well. Uh, in Hyderabad, they have a place called Anurag, where uh, they have computers with uh, GPUs too. Well, there are, there are many others too in the country. The GPUs are still not in much use in India. So um, we went to Hyderabad and uh, did this on uh, the GPUs and of course the associated uh, CPUs as well, uh, graphic processing units being made by NVIDIA. And um, this was work was done by this uh, this this work was done by Maruti. And you can see that uh, your great advantages in the rate at which data is processed, if you look at this curve, and the number of cores, the GPUs that you have, as you increase the number of cores with uh, different GPUs here, and this is what you get with CPUs, no GPUs. You use, on the other hand, 300 GPUs. You can see how much the rate as uh, and the number of cores increases. It's the, it's the time taken by core per mesh cell per iteration. And you can see that you can make very uh, low values here. This is a computational domain. Looks similar. <clears throat> and uh, we also used uh, RANS cores to compare them with and uh, use compressible linear Stokes equations. You've seen this before. Leading edge. And uh, the grid sizes. You could not do very high resolution grids here. Um, the Mach number is 0.16. The exit Mach number is about 0.6. The Reynolds numbers here are higher. 152,000. We have not been able to make a fully resolved Reynolds number simulation uh, of these ranges. Well, we have to spend much more time on computers. Uh, so that's still work to be done. But one big difference between this simulation and the other one which I showed you earlier is that the angle of attack here is zero. Let's say the flow is coming in in a direction which is not having to, uh, to turn around the leading edge an enormous amount. <clears throat> and uh, here is the pressure distribution. Um, once again, I, I prefer to sit down, excuse me, if you don't mind. Uh, the pink curve, you can see, is a DNS, direct numerical solution. Uh, once again, on the pressure side, at the top, the agreement is very good. And below here, well, the circles are the experimental points. And you can see that they're separated by quite some distance. But uh, the and the name of Stokes solution is giving you a curve, and it, it catches these, these differences between those points. Goes through the points, but it will tell you also what's happening between those points. <clears throat> Clearly, the experiment did not have the resolution needed to catch, catch these little things in the pressure distribution. <clears throat> the pressure distribution agrees reasonably well. So, although resolution is not quite as much as you would have liked to have had, we have these solutions. These are once again on the pressure surface. With these solutions, where we compare what the DNA is giving, which is this purple line down below, at this resolution, with what you would get 
from a typical ranch coat that would be here at the top. That also has a somewhat similar shape, but it is a very different values from what you have in the DNS solution. And here is something hybrid. This, uh, th th these, these dots, D, is a hybrid. <clears throat> it's a large eddy simulation, but with RAN solution near the wall. And you see that somehow actually does better than, um, than the larger dissimulation itself would do. And that's because the ranch things, as they also take experimental data, uh, they get it more nearly right than the larger dissimulation does near the wall. But once again, now, we really don't have any evidence to say which one of these is actually right. <clears throat> If you do a higher resolution, uh, not a very much higher one, so I don't want to place too much emphasis on these results. It's really something, um, uh, something still part of work going on, works in progress. You can see that there are slight changes over most of the blade. Okay, from there to here, you hardly see any difference due to the resolution change here from 94 million to 129 million. But out here, it is somewhat different. <clears throat> uh, relatively small change in resolution makes the pressure gradient steeper and occur at a slightly different place compared to what it would have done otherwise. <clears throat> well, I won't uh, swear that uh, the high resolution is much uh, different or better than the other one. But you can see that by and large, the pressure distributions obtained from DNS at the zero angle of attack case are in good agreement with whatever data are available from the experiments. But the flow itself can be very different. Once again, that uh, change in the pressure distribution changes the skin friction distribution in this critical area. In fact, according to this, the flow is separating in this area. There's a small separation bubble because you can see the skin friction coefficient is negative. Slightly negative, it's zero here. So this part of it, very small thing here, is, is probably a separated flow. You need to confirm that from much higher resolution runs. Well, here is a supersonic thing. I will quickly go through it because uh, uh, well, I think that uh, there's a higher resolution thing. At the operating conditions, we have Mach number contours here, and you can see the flow goes uh, supersonic, uh, subsonic flow coming in, shock waves from the trailing edges, reflected off the, uh, off the surfaces of these blades, cutting across the wakes. So it's uh, it's uh, quite a complicated flow. And once again, the code can give you all of that. Uh, here is a case where the exit Mach number is 1.34, so it's supersonic. The pressure coefficient. Now, we are not doing DNS here. It turns out that between LNS and SST, it is in fact possible in this case to get reasonably good pressure distributions. Partly because the angle of attack is zero, and nothing very wild seems to be happening. So, the temperature distribution, reasonable. So we're getting to the stage where if nothing very wild happens, those other methods of computing can be of some use. So let me conclude. Why is there a zoo on the turbine blade? The Reynolds numbers are in that awkward range, number one. The critical Reynolds number on a flat plate is only a little more than 10 to the 5. So that's when things are very twitchy on the flow, vulnerable to rapid changes. Blade curvature sharpens both direct and reverse transition, very high near the leading edge, not amenable to classical boundary layer theory, not even sort of correction. On the suction side, it's very sensitive to the resolution, 
and can exhibit dramatic changes, can be handled by DNS with adequate resolution. The pressure side is usually smoothly well behaved and is mild rather than wild and is amenable to rants and illness models. If we have adequate resolution, it agrees with what the experiments have. There's a strong coupling between the pressure distribution and the skin friction distribution. And events like transition, delaminarization, and separation in the modest and not summer range. And effects stronger because the domain is confined. A comment about the LNS, which is the large eddy and RANS together, does not always agree with DNS, but is generally closer than any other RANS model including, in fact, quite often, the large eddy simulation itself. For the Bangalore engine, with an inlet Mach number M equal to 0.29, both SSC and LNS promised results are close to DNS. So based on this experience, this is, of course, not directly fluid mechanics, we find that using GPU-based supercomputers, actually very useful. When I cut down computing time. I remember three or four years ago when we wanted to do this, I talked to the people here about how useful they would be for DNS. Uh, they were not, so I had a, an hour's chat with the people in the United States. And they said, well, we would not recommend it for you just now, two or three years from now, maybe. When it's happened the two or three years from now, and they have collaborated with us in using the GPUs. Two or three years from then, GPUs are actually working pretty well. And something which I would now recommend as uh, things which can do much faster for you, a combination. So, that's basically what we have found till now. There's still many things to be done, but I thought some of you may be interested in knowing how far you can get about these simulations. And I must say that the simulations I reported here are new and bigger than anything anybody else has done before with whatever computers we have. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Nasima, for this excellent lecture. And we don't have a lot of time, but we have a little time for a few questions. So, Spenta. Uh, hi. Ah, uh, yes. I saw in one of you, one of your slides a temperature of the order of fifteen hundred degrees centigrade. That's right. So, what type of material this blade is made of actually that uh, yeah. because that's too high for uh, metals melt well, yeah that's been well a lot of the progress in uh, gas turbines actually depends on new materials materials which have been developed just for this purpose they're usually superalloys of various kinds uh, used to be nickel based and now um, there have been many other developments they make single crystal blades with all kinds of uh, trace elements put in there and that's, that's a whole separate industry and field by itself. Uh, in fact, uh, I would say that progress in uh, gas turbines has depended quite a lot on, um, on materials technology and, uh, and uh, the special, especially the super alloys, the nickel super alloys, nickel based super alloys, we use quite extensively. Single crystal blades coming into. Any other question? Yes. Uh, uh, thanks a lot uh, for the talk. Uh, I'd ask you that uh, this uh, CP and CF, how much are the sensitive on the, on the temperature gradients? That is, if I do an isothermal assumption, ah, yeah. will I recover the CP and CF almost accurately? That is true. Yes. Well, no, these are things which have to be, which are still to be investigated. Okay. I do think that they may matter. And um, that's why. I want to say this is work in progress. This is not exactly something which you would say must happen, especially in the uh, compressed supersonic cases. There was one there on an operating condition. 
Now, on that operating condition, you should really have these, uh, temp this temperature dependence. You have it on the viscosity, right. but not yet on the specific heat and so on. Right. So, I would still therefore leave that as a more open. Can I ask one more? Sure, thing? sure. How about the centrifugal force due to the turbine rotation? These are all on the, made, made on stator. Okay, okay, stator. Right. <laughs> but even there, you can ask that question. Because uh, the thing which is missing is that these, these simulations have been made on the stator blades. But upstream, unless there's a first stage in the, in the, uh, in the engine, you know, in the turbine. If the first stage, then of course, it's okay. But um, if it has a rotor upstream, it awakes from the rotor blades, it increases. And therefore, the disturbance environment also matters a great deal. That is also not there. Therefore, these are still, as I said, the first steps. And uh, but taking account of uh, awakes is probably not too difficult. Uh, you, you would have to, uh, but uh, not easy to make them realistic either without solving for the upstream blade. There's still a long way to go. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's right. That's I think we'll take uh, one last question from the back there. Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you, sir, for the nice talk. Uh, I wanted to ask that in your simulations, um, it, like if you take into account the fluid structure interactions, how 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 are those going to affect? Sorry, which interactions? The fluid structure interactions. Ah. So how are those going to affect the turbul uh, the um, evolution of the? Of course, the gas turbine blades do have aeroelastic problems, and um, the designers usually spend a lot of time trying to find out what those uh, interactions will be. And that uh, is something which is a factor in design. But uh, when we're talking about these test results, uh, that is not such an issue because they're done with blades which uh, uh, really are not interacting with aerodynamic pressure in any very flexible way. The structural design of the blades, uh, in the real engine, is of course a more delicate affair than it would be in a test setup. Okay. But the blade elasticity is a problem. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank. Oh, there is one more. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely the last one. Yes, please. Uh, hello, sir. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, in your slides on uh, skin friction at higher higher resolutions, you say uh, you talk about DNS at two different grid resolutions. So, uh, to uh, if we do proper grid uh, grid conversion study, the res uh, the solution should at least I mean at some point should reach the anal um, the actual solutions, right? So, this uh, variation in the result might actually be the lack of proper grid conversion study or something or should we right. do, the, do it at higher right rate? that's why that's why i'm very tentative about those results you see a grid conversion study on dns is very expensive you know <laughs> you take a lot of time to get one solution and uh, you, you can't always afford them at a Reynolds number of 300,000, we can't afford them not possible uh, one of the reasons why we could uh, do that in the first case that I showed, T106. In an number there was only 50,000. At 50,000, we could afford to do a grid conversion study because the demand of the 50,000 grid was not very high. So we went from 50,000 to 150,000. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm uh, saying that in the, in the grid, the number of grid points, we went from 20,000 25,000 to 150, 160,000. 160 million, I'm, I'm getting those numbers. So we went from, and let me repeat it, 25 million to 160 million in grid points. That was enough for us to give grid convergence. And because it was affordable, we actually did what? Four, four things in between, three, three or four in between. So we know that the grid has converged there. I can't make that statement for the second case. So, uh, follow up. Um, uh, so, 
philosophical question, but can we call that DNS uh, since the grid conversion study is not satisfied? Kind it's of. a DNS course resolution, not to be trusted till, till further evidence. That's why I'm making that comment again and again. <laughs> okay, I think that there these um, conference allows enough time for you to continue the conversations after the lecture. So let us thank President Arsima to get, give us a great start.